Why your home though? Why won't you do it outside of your home? Well, this is such a great location. Why not do it here? And you'd rather bring the outside in as well. So well, introduce everyone to everything you do. The landscape here is so beautiful. There, there's no place I could go on a vacation that would be more beautiful than being right here. What other kind of workshops do you do? Well, I do teach a color course. And uh, that's something that I offer on a regular basis every so many months. Um, sometimes the workshops are a four-hour workshop. Sometimes they're a full weekend. They'll be about something specific, like um, there's one called the unconventional portrait. So instead of teaching traditional portrait painting, I take all of the techniques from, say, Rembrandt up to contemporary people now and um, sh show people how to do a portrait. And um, it's a great way for people to do uh, an investigation of personality also. I know you have an exhibition mm -hmm. at TT Gallery in New London. It's exhibiting now? Yes. Now? Okay. And also in the Union Railroad Station. In the Union Railroad Station. This is the second part of the interview where Joan is going to speak of her uh, exhibition, Land Alive, which is now being displayed at the Union Station in New London, Connecticut. Joan, tell us about Land Alive. And the paintings see. in the Union Station have a theme that puts them together that is separate from the paintings that are shown at the Tizi Gallery. When I went to uh, Yellowstone to do these big panoramic landscapes, I was noticing that the palette was very platinum. The steam was coming out of the ground. There was white, crusty stuff from the sulfur all over the ground, and the trees were shimmering silver. And when I when the trade towers fell, I went down to Ground Zero to see it in person so I could try and comprehend what had happened. And I was struck by the fact that it was the same palette and the smoke was coming out of the ground and there were so many similarities. The other thing was, was that when I went to Yellowstone, I could feel the presence of the first Americans in the landscape there. And when I went down to Ground Zero, I could, of course, feel the lost lives there as well. So I wondered if I was witnessing the beginning and the end of mankind in America going full circle. So when I came back from Ground Zero, I made the triptych that's hanging here. And um, some, uh, some things happened when I made that triptych. Um, I had d done a, a charcoal study of a de Kooning painting called Excavation that was in my studio, and it was just for my own uh, investigation. Nobody was going to see it. And when I went down to Ground Zero, I realized that the whole landscape of all of the debris on the ground kind of reminded me of that painting. So I cut up my drawing, and I started the triptych by collaging that picture into the drawing. The other uh, eerie part of that is that the only time I ever went up into the Trade Towers was um, about a year before they fell when uh, some friends had come to town and they wanted to go there. And I never wanted to go up to the Trade Towers because for some reason I felt that they were not permanent. I just had a, a psychic feeling about it and the people uh, knew that, but at the last minute they bodily grabbed me and dragged me in, and I went up into the elevator. Here comes the train. <laughs> the train. Great feeling to hear the train. What happens is that if you you go and experience something and you just Never really forget. process it, then what comes out when you're working is uh, the essential elements. You sift out everything that doesn't 
contribute to the mm, message yes. that you're trying yes. to convey. Okay. This is called the Tower of Yellowstone. Okay. That one butte is called Tower. It's in the northern part of Yellowstone. And I, I felt that the people who traveled across Siberia and trickled down in through what is now Yellowstone and were the early Native Americans who basically started this country. And uh, you, you, you can feel the presence of those people in the land. You also feel that the earth was kind of created yesterday and it's still cooling off and steaming. Sure. So um, it has a timeless quality. So the Ground Zero also had a timeless quality because the only source of light were the emergency lights and the sky was capped with the smoke. Mm. So it had an eerie uh, sensation of not knowing if it was day or night and time seemed to just stop while they were searching the ruins for survivors. Have you visited the Ground Zero since you last? No. Went there and took photos and did you? I didn't take photos. I stayed there for a day and I just looked at it. So all of this is part of your vivid imagine, you know, just your vivid just photo taking it in. memory. Taking wow. it in. And reconstructing it mm -hmm. as I built the triptych. We're going to take a tour to the Titsi Gallery, uh, which is our part three of the Joan Levy Hepburn interview. Thank you. Thank you for, uh, okay. for letting us know about your exhibition, Land Alive. And so this will stay here through October, October 13th. 13th. So those who do want to come and visit the display of Land Alive, it will be displaying uh, up to October the 13th. This is now the third part of the show uh, exhibiting Joan B.B. Hepburn's art exhibition uh, entitled Land Alive and it's part of Ground Zero and with me is Mark Roberts. Mark Roberts is the corporate chairman of the TT Gallery at State Street New London. It's not often we in this area get to see an artist who's this good. Um, her work is extraordinary uh, but mostly what what struck me was when I first saw her work, she, she's taken something which we think of as simple um, landscapes. It's not what you think of as powerful work typically. Um, and she took it to a whole different level. It's, it's more than, she captures more than what the landscape looks like. She also captures what it feels like. What it feels like to be like moonlight landscape. What it feels like to be in the woods in the middle of the night on a, on a full moon night. And it's effective. It's a very powerful work. One of the things that, that I really like about her artwork is the fact that it's not decorative. It's right. actual. Right. It's what you see is what you get. And she brings out the best in that. Absolutely. And I really admire that kind yes. of artwork. Yeah, you know, she's too. done a fantastic job. Me too. More with her mediums. Obsess on color theory all the time. It's one of the things that fascinates me. I, d I don't want to make paintings that are purely about color. I like to attach them to subject matter, so I, I like having them connected to the landscape. I feel that, for me, it's just n not enough to make paintings that are just purely about color. I like to plug them into a subject. All the proceeds from the sales um, of all of Joan's work and catalogs, etc., and donations that people make are all going to a scholarship fund we've set up it's called the Joan Levy Hepburn Scholarship Fund, which goes to needy kids, kids labeled at risk. Um, so this all goes to help them get art classes or to pay for their art classes, actually. Is there anything else that you like to do? I do enjoy teaching. And uh, I like teaching children a lot because I, I feel that I don't have any children, but I, I feel that it's... Uh, it's a great responsibility to teach children, and it is. they are the future. So if I can convey something to them that will benefit them and open their eyes and teach them to think big thoughts. Learning how to draw has nothing to do with making art or having talent. It's about learning how to see 
and anybody can learn to see, learning how to open their eyes and see at any age. And that's the part of teaching that I really like because when they start to open their eyes and see, then they show me things too. So when you say you teach them how to see, does that mean you teach them to see what, what they're in front of them or beyond that or surrounding well, them? We go through the world with a very quick cursory glance at things as if we're driving the car by and we just go and that's how much we observe. And, and actually our eyes work by, by grabbing bits of things and organizing it and putting, the, putting it all together. And I guess what I do is in, instead of uh, letting a person hang on to what they think they see or what they, they know in their mind already about what they think they see, I make them look at what's in front of them. And uh, lots of times it's something very simple. So it's what, what they, they want to focus on, what they, they It's what, what they, they, what they know see. about you oh, without, okay. without seeing you. But if they really look at you without being able to name your knee or the pad, then they see this as one continuous hybrid form, which is now you're part of this pad. And that's how you have to see the connectedness of everything. I know you for being an artist. That's how I met you, for being an artist. What is your passion? Is it teaching or being the artist? I would have to say that the passion is about what fulfills your heart more? Being alive. <laughs> <laughs> being alive to do all these things, right? Be, it's all about being alive. Okay. When you're alive, you're, you're seeing, you're hearing. You're you touching. The world of your, all your sensations, color, texture, uh, thinking, all of it together. So you, you are a very peaceful person. No, no. <laughs> you're not peaceful at all? I wouldn't say that. No? No. So how do you describe Joan? Oh, uh, <laughs> I guess I guess you'd say I'm a pretty live wire. <laughs> well, that's a good thing. Hopefully, it makes people realize that we all are in this world together. Mm -hmm. We all have to be kind to each other support each other when we can, and be kind to the landscape and take care of the planet we live on. What do you want to convey to the youth? What I try to convey to them is that they have an, uh, an option. They don't have to choose uh, street gangs or uh, ways of finding their identity that create a negative end for them. There are nonviolent, more positive ways of finding their individual identity. And you can't, you can't really blame kids for getting into trouble because some of them come from places where nobody ever told them anything good about themselves. And, or, or, or how to, uh, emerge from the environment. So okay. uh, what I try to do is, is help them find a way out. That's great. Joan, I want to thank you very much for giving us the opportunity to be here uh, and interview you and know about you. You're an inspiration to us. Again, thank you very much for watching the Rebecca Flores Show, and I want to thank Joan uh, Levy Hepburn for being with us today.